Therefore go is my title this morning. Therefore go. That could be that could be a go-kart track if the guy with the flag is saying go. It could be a ski race down the mountain. And their time trials are going on. And looking up at the lights. And the lights change from stop to go. Therefore, go. But in the context of where we're going this morning, obviously we're not on a ski mountain, we're not at a racetrack. Therefore, go indicates what are we doing after Easter? Therefore, go. We've heard the story. And most of us fully understand the story. We've heard it year after year. And we understand that Christ died on the cross for us. But there's some residual cleanup that needs to take place in each one of our lives. I think of feeding the 5,000 and they had all of these crumbs left over. Far more than anyone's expectations. And the residual cleanup is you and I. Is where are we going to go? Therefore, God is saying, therefore, go. What is God really saying? Therefore, go. We talked last week about what just happened. Trying to wrap our head around a person being beaten brutally. laid down on a wooden cross and nails driven through his hands and his feet. Hard for us to rationalize, isn't it? Hard for us to wrap our head around that. To understand the fact that Jesus laid on his cross. Jesus didn't try to run and escape. All that he went through for us. But the residual is for us to do something with it. For you and I to do something with Easter. Last week, what just happened? And in verse 3 that Dean read, there was something that God freely gave us to live by. We've already spoke about it this morning was in the text, but we're going to go to do a funny here this morning, and it's an Easter funny. The pastor's family was invited Easter dinner, dinner <clears throat> at the Wilson's home. Mrs. Wilson was widely known for her amazing contribution to church potlucks. Everyone was seated around the table as the food was being served. As usual, it was a feast for your eyes, the nose and the platelet. When the pastor's youngest son, Peter, received his plate, he started eating straight away. Peter, wait, wait until we say grace, insisted his embarrassed father. I don't have to, the five-year-old replied. Yeah, they would say that. Mm -hmm. Of course you do, Peter. His mother insisted rather forcefully. We always say prayer before eating at our house. That's at our house, Peter explained, but this is Mrs. Wilson's home, and she knows how to cook. <laughs> if you look back, you've got it here. <laughs> we continue to celebrate Easter days, months, and years, knowing and understanding that Jesus died on the cross for us. However, can we say that it, it, it that we have been resurrected ourselves, made new by the living water of hope? Have you been transformed during the days of Lent coming to the celebration of Easter? If there's something in you that has not been transformed, then the process of going through Easter means nothing. It means nothing in your life. We are to be transformed even if it's a microcosm 
of something that is different in you today than it was 50 days ago. To go through the process of Easter, to get dressed up for Easter, have the Easter egg hot and the family over and all of that is wonderful. It really is. Are you a changed person because of Easter? Have you been resurrected? Peter was one of the 12 disciples that Jesus chose to lead the church. Even after Peter denied Jesus during his trial. Peter denied Jesus in the crowd. However, the good news, the good news for us is that Peter repented and began, became a great apostle. So as we struggle with trials and tribulations, we too can repent and start over with God. Have you done that? Have you been on your knees to say, God, I'm not good at this. I need help with this. I don't like part of me. And I ask you to be in my life to walk me through it. So as we struggle with trials and tribulations, we too can repent and start over with God. Can you imagine denying Jesus and, and God giving him enough and God giving him enough to forgive him and God loving him enough to forgive him? Can you imagine that? Denying Jesus. Who would deny Jesus? I just can't wrap my head around that one. Goes to show us that no matter how ugly our past was and too many people hang on to their past, it contaminates their soul, their thoughts, and their minds. God will wrap his arms around wrap his arms around us and say, I will be with you to help carry your burdens every day. The scriptures that Dean just read. Believe this, folks. Believe this. Believe that God will wrap his loving arms around us. The scripture goes on to say in verse 4, when we fall in love with Jesus, the inheritance that you can never perish. Spoil or fade. Now there's assurance right there that when we become a child of God, and then being a child of God isn't just saying that I'm a child of God. Being a child of God means that you're going to grow up in the ammunition of loving God through Bible study, through caring for other people, for reaching out to people that God has empowered us to do and relying on the Holy Spirit to help you do that. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So once you decide to give your life to God, your inheritance has already been made. It is written that you are saved by God's grace in heaven. I will go and prepare a place for you. Amen? I will go and prepare a place for you. Your inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is a promise by God. I think of retirement. And who will care for me? Will I have enough money? Who will get my money? Or what burden will I be for others? These are all legitimate questions that our flesh wants to know before they take place. Who would ever know whether there's enough money to retire or not? We certainly don't want to be a burden to anyone, do we? I don't want to be a burden to anyone. But God is saying, I have a place prepared for my children, so as the old Greyhound commercial once said in the 80s, sit back and relax and leave the driving to us. I don't know if anybody remembers that old Greyhound commercial. <laughs> but for some reason, I never forgot it. Sit back, relax, and leave the driving to us. God continues to remind us to therefore go and make disciples for me. Amen? Amen. God is saying, go, make disciples for me. 
Don't get so stuck on your own problems. Get your mind off yourself. Get your mind off your problems. God is saying, be my child by giving yourself to me and I will carry your burdens for you. Not easy to do, I understand that. In verse 6 and 7, in all of this, I say, in all of this, greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Isn't life all kinds of trials? It seems like there's one after another, isn't there? It's always something. And I can assure you there'll be more trials that you don't even have a clue what's coming your way. Our health, our money, our vehicle, our family, our children. We have no idea what's coming tomorrow. But God is saying, you don't need to know. Put your trust, your whole trust in me. Let me be your steering wheel. Let me be your guide. Go, therefore, make disciples for me. These have come so that the proven genuineness of faith, which is greater worth than gold, but will, will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. These have come so that the proven genuineness of our faith, as I just said, we don't raise our hand and say, I'm a Christian. God knows the genuineness of each one of us. He knows our, our sincerity. He knows if we're real or if we're fake. We can be real when we come to church and everything's wonderful. Are we real when we go out into the mission field beyond these doors? Or are we a different person? God knows our genuineness. He knows what you're thinking this moment. He knows that you have something planned for this afternoon. God knows the genuineness of our faith, which is greater worth than gold. I know it's hard to understand how the struggles of life can be good for us. But Peter is saying, greatly rejoice. You've heard me say in the past that be grateful that there are trials and difficulties coming your way. Because that's when we grow the most. We won't grow if we're just status quo and everything's wonderful all the time. But the trials form our character. They shape who we are. They strengthen our ability to endure another storm that comes our way. It isn't doom and gloom when you love God. When you love God enough to know that I trust you, God. I know you have this. I commit myself to you. There are many reasons why we struggle at times, but think of it this way. <clears throat> As I just said, would we have grown to our Savior if this trial or that trial happened? In most cases, we would not have grown. We don't like change. We don't embrace it. But I think we all can admit one thing. There is something I don't like about myself. There's something everybody in here can say. There's something I don't like about me. And unless we trust God with it, we will never enjoy God's full favor on our lives or allow us to greatly rejoice what God can do. We just won't. We can give him a little nibble of it or you're going to get a little nibble back of a little tiny rejoice. It's only going to be a little rejoice. The measure, give, the measure given will be measured given back. Open up your heart to be vulnerable. There's a word. One thing I've noticed in my life of, of leading church and being involved in most committees that existed and some that didn't is Pastors, especially pastors, do not leave themselves vulnerable. I am fully transparent with my ministry. 
I am who I am. You've heard stories about me and my walk in life, my struggles, my difficulties, and you'll continue to hear them as I stand here. But the only way that we can let something go of our past is to be vulnerable and admit, and admit to God and share with others that I'm not good at something. And that's where we lean on and trust God the most. When we can trust him. And yes, knowing that man will hurt you. When you leave yourself vulnerable, man will hurt you. Loved ones will criticize you. That's probably the worst. You know, we have that existing in our family. You know, the loved ones you thought would be right beside you. They're not all right beside you. I've heard somebody once say, well, how come you spend so much time down at that church? Well, that's between you and God. Even family. Hmm. Loved ones will criticize you. But the hope in Jesus Christ is where we gain our greatest joy. Amen? Amen. That's our greatest joy. If you're doing all of this church stuff and you're coming to church and being part of all of his ministry, I pray that you're finding some joy in that. There's some soul satisfaction in all of it. Down here, deep. Though you may not have seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an impressionable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verses 8 and 9. Salvation of our souls. You know, I think we all want to be happy people. Do we not? We all want to live in peace. We all want our families to get along. Do we not? Can't we just get along? One thing we can be sure of, God's children, His faithful children, is that we all know where we're going at the end of this trial that we're in. The resurrection life of Jesus Christ provides a pathway for each one of us. A salvation in Jesus Christ beyond this time here. Amen? Amen? Amen. There's a certain amount of peace in all of that and comfort in all of that. But that doesn't mean we get to go back and sin like we used to sin. And, you know, they're, again, going back to the transformation of who we are and whose we are. Have we been resurrected from Easter? Are we different people today than we were days ago? You have been given a new resurrection of hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I tell you, therefore go. Therefore go.